All right, welcome back to another vid. Friday brew. Got my cup of tea ready, can you see that? It's hot, fresh from the kettle. So I'm not gonna have a sip for at least a few minutes because it'll scold my mouth and that'll be the worst vid of all time. You might laugh, but uh, yeah, I'm not doing that for views, I'll tell you that. So welcome back to another vid. Yeah, I said a Friday brew, it's the weekend brew, isn't it? Because it's just, yeah, just too lazy to do it on the Friday, so it's gonna be uploaded on a, today's Friday, but by the time it's uploaded, it'll be uh, Saturday. So yeah, it's been a while since I've made a vid. Um, just busy, lazy, the whole COVID thing knocking about still. It's not going away anytime soon, is it? It's just, oh, what a drag. I mean, I'm a really positive person. I am, genuinely, but even me, from time to time, in more recent times, I've been like, bloody hell. So, I mean, if there's someone out there, maybe yourself or people you know, people we all know, you know, who easily get down or depressed a little bit, you maybe just, you know, look out for them. Send them an email, a message, how they doing. I know it sounds cheap and cheesy and all the rest of it, but, you know, if someone like myself, you know, who's, like I say, is very lively and positive, and if I start to feel like, oh, God, bloody hell, then what must it be like for those who are always like that or regularly like that? So... Yeah, maybe look out for people. It's nice to send people a little bit of a message and just, you don't have to spend hours talking to them, but just say how you're doing, you know, look out for them. Your neighbours or all that kind of stuff. I'll tell you what, speaking of neighbours, this, this just come to me just now, actually. So I think he's all right, but the neighbour across the street there, I'm pointing like you know him and you know where I'm pointing to. Just trust me, it's across the street. Um, there's an old guy who lives there. I think, I hope it's not the case, but I think his wife died ages ago, like maybe even years ago. He's a really old guy, and uh, and yesterday the I heard like an ambulance, the sirens going in the distance. It's not too uncommon, you know. It's America, you know, cop cars and stuff. They're always going off, and um, but it got progressively closer. And there's a hospital not too far away anyway, so that's another reason why I guess you hear it regularly. Um, and it got yeah progressively closer, and it started to come up the street. And I was like bloody hell, and then it started to slow down as it was kind of approaching my house. Which makes you think immediately, bloody hell, it must be someone, there's a problem with someone around here. And so yeah, I kind of watched as they parked uh, across the house, uh, across the street from me, outside the old guy's house over there. And uh, like a city ambulance then turned up as well. But the guy who was getting out was very casual, uh, with like sort of a stretcher and unfolding it. So I don't think he's dead, thankfully. Uh, maybe he just, you know, had a fall or something. You know, when you're old and elderly and frail, uh, sadly, these things can happen. So I think I hope he's all right, and uh, and that's that. But it made me laugh because, in a way, uh, but a bit guilty now because about a month ago, maybe I was looking outside. Sorry, I was looking outside. I was on the computer, and I, out the corner of my eye, I saw someone walking up towards the door, and I thought, who's that? I thought maybe it's the postman because I didn't really get a glimpse of them. Uh, maybe it could be someone like just you know wanting to sell something or whatever it might be and um, all of a sudden they sort of started to turn around and, and walk back down the drive and I thought that was a bit weird and then they started to walk back towards the door again and he did that like a couple of times and I thought this is really really weird and it was like an old guy now obviously it was the guy across the street I didn't just didn't recognize him you know looking at a bit of a distance at an angle from the house and, and then he walked up towards the door and he was slightly out of view from where I was looking, but I knew he was there on the porch. And he must have been there for about two minutes. Now, that's not really a long time, but if you think about standing there, not really doing anything for two minutes, that is a long time. And I thought, this is really weird. So I started gingerly to go towards the door and because I thought, well, it could be anyone. You know, should I avoid this potential confrontation or... Or what? But then there's someone on my property, so what do you do? So we started to walk away again, and I thought, right, I'm going to open the door and figure out what's going on. So I did it. I kind of put on my kind of, you know, the bravado, and it's like, yeah, and I was ready. I was ready for a fight. I really was as well, just in case. Uh, you know, sometimes how you just up for it. I was like, I'm ready for whatever you want to throw, boy. I'm ready. And so I opened the door quite forcefully, and I went, you all right? sort of like passively aggressively and he turned round and that's when I could see it was like the old guy and, and the neighbour and I felt really guilty you know because the way I said it like you're all right you know or, what's going on or something like that um and he turned round and I'm not gonna like mimic his you know uh, his accent or anything you know but he he said oh um he says yeah sorry he says I'm just delivering uh, these letters 
uh, and then he started to walk back up towards me and he, and he handed me a couple that were, were for me. Or for my wife, maybe, I can't remember now. Just junk mail as well. Now, essentially what had happened is the postman earlier on that day, really lazily, had left pretty much everyone's mail at the old guy's house and just put it in his letterbox, like out the mailbox outside. I don't know why they'd do that, to talk about laziness. So I feel sorry for him, and I did at the time. So basically the old guy went to get his mail and he opened up his mailbox and there's like 50 letters there for all the houses in the vicinity. And it was just ridiculous. So he was going along uh, to all these houses, including ours, and, and delivering the mail. An old guy, he must be like about 90, and could hardly walk. That's the thing as well. When I was watching him outside, before I realised who it was, he was walking really, really slow. You know how stereotypical old people, but even slower than that. It was like, I tell you what, if he'd had a race with a snail, he'd have lost. It was that he was that slow. I felt really sorry for him. And, um, but yeah, so especially because of his age, for the postman to have done that, bang out of order that was. So I, t I took the mail off him and then I, I do remember saying to him, I said, is there a lot? Is there a lot of stuff? And he went, oh no, this is just another couple or something that he's got to like deliver next door. If he'd have said there's loads, genuinely, I would have helped him because it was already on my mind as he was saying it. And of course, to his face, I was like, oh, that's awful. How could they, why would they do that? You know, really, it annoyed me. It annoyed me how they do that. So maybe it was someone new on the job um, the regular postman's, uh, he's good, so he wouldn't have done that, uh, and he's been doing it for a long, long time, so maybe it's just someone new helping in, or helping out for the day maybe, didn't know the street, didn't know the area, it's no excuse, um, but maybe that's what happened, I don't know. So anyway, that's a little story about the, uh, the old guy. Another little story before I move on um, to uh, the, the usual stuff, what I've been playing and listening to, watching and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this was probably about three weeks ago there or thereabouts and it was on a Thursday that the main story is a Friday of what happened but it was the Thursday of about three weeks ago woke up in the morning uh, obviously and uh, I looked outside and the sky was kind of dusky it was really weird like the Sun had like kind of a an orange glow to it and I thought that looks really weird so I took a picture and uh, put it on Twitter I'll show you now and uh, yeah, just kind of posted and went, yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? it? kind of just looks a bit abnormal. But within a few hours, there or thereabouts, it had kind of gone back to what it was and it was a relatively speaking normal day. There was still a bit of a glow. It was still slightly odd, but for the most part, it just looked all right um, and, and pretty normal. So put that picture on Twitter. Someone responded to, well, a few people responded, but one in particular, it made me laugh because they took the photo that I put on there and they obviously edited it in like Photoshop or something. And, uh, and they'd said, because I think in my comment, as you would have seen or are seeing now, I said something like, this is weird, it looks like Tatooine off Star Wars. And Tatooine, of course, has two moons, doesn't it? So someone had edited it, as you'll see now, and there they said, no, nah, this is Tatooine. And it was pretty funny, liked it, left the comment, all the rest of it. So that was that. Now, went to bed, next morning, uh, I had a hair appointment, which I'll come to as well in a second, since it's like a, two stories in one. Uh, you know, you'll know the one if you've watched my vids before. It's the North Korean. No, it isn't. It's a South Korean uh, hairdresser who's <laughs> bloody eccentric. A character and a half. So I had a hair appointment at 10 o'clock in the morning on the Friday. So, yeah, so the, the, the weird kind of sun for a few hours um, was on the Thursday. Went to bed, woke up on Friday morning. I'd set my alarm for about 7.30. Now, I'm one of those people. I don't know if you're the same. I'm one of those who uh, very, very frequently, when the alarm goes off, I knock it off and I go back to sleep. But it's worse than that, because when I do eventually get up, I can't remember knocking the bloody alarm off. It just literally, I just can't remember doing it. And I've tried all sorts in the past. I've put alarms, this is going to sound mad, I've put alarms in boxes. I've not taped them up. You know, we're not talking like padlocked with a key and a combination or anything. But just put them in like a box. So I'd have to like open up the box and take the alarm out. I put alarms in drawers before, like in a sock drawer. So I'd have to take, like, pull the drawer out and rumble around for the bloody, uh, or rummage around for the for the phone and uh, or the alarm, and then knock it off. But even then, sometimes I'll just go back to sleep and not remember doing it. I'm really bad with that, really bad. If you're the same, I feel a little bit uh, less bad. But um, so yeah, so I'd set the alarm for around about half past seven in the morning, something like that. And uh, and obviously it it gone off, and I'd done my usual, I'd turn the, the, the alarm off and went back to sleep. 
And then I woke up around about three or four times, about three or four times, in what must have been about an hour, I'm guessing. But every time I woke up, uh, and you know, you're opening your eyes, and it was like really sort of dark and orangey outside. It sort of looked like it was about sort of four o'clock in the morning, 4.30, like a, a, a maybe just before sunset. So I just thought in my head, as I'm very groggy and waking up, I just thought, well, I've got to go back to sleep because it's obviously crazy o'clock in the morning. But after the third or fourth time of this happening, of waking up and seeing the same sort of light, or, or lack of it really, I thought this is weird because the fourth, third or fourth time I woke up, I felt really vibrant. You know the, the times where you wake up and you can just kind of, you're so awake that you could just jump out of bed and start dancing. That's what it was like. I didn't do that, but that's what it felt it was like. I was so awake. And I thought this is unusual because I feel really awake and I've now woke up three or four times and I kind of, you know, looked down at my iPod, so I reached, reached down to, the, to the, uh, the carpet and picked it up expecting it to say maybe six o'clock. My hair appointment was at 10 o'clock, remember? And I, I swear to God, I looked at it, 9.58. 9.58 in the morning. And I thought, what the? Now, I know people have woken up way later than that before, even I have. It's not that much of a big deal. But I couldn't believe it was 9.58, not just because I had a hair appointment in two minutes, which is absolutely ludicrous, but also the sky was absolutely orange. Again, I'll be putting some pictures up for you to see now. And I don't know, it might, this might have made the news in, uh, in the UK, I'm not sure. Um, I guess you can tell me if it did or if it didn't. It was really, really weird. This is all in California, all on the West Coast. And I'm guessing it probably went up to like Oregon and Washington and all that kind of West Coast, basically, Pacific Coast. And uh, it was so strange. Uh, now, if it was early in the morning and a sunset thing, it maybe wouldn't be that unusual. But um, it was, yeah, it was really, really strange, especially for like 10 o'clock in the morning. So the first thing I did was realised it was 9.58, thought, bloody hell, I'm nearly late for my uh, hair appointment in two minutes. I'm never going to have a shower and obviously get changed and then get there in two minutes. So, I, and then I look, immediately looked outside, kind of pulled the curtain to one side. It was like, that is really, what's going on? This is weird. Went online, this is the first thing we all do these days, and type it into like Twitter or what have you, like, Orange Skies, California, what the hell's going on? And uh, yeah, it's widespread. Now, basically, ultimately what it was... It's all the wildfires, which again, I think may be making the news uh, in um, in the UK. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, there's been a lot of them here. There usually is. It's not been new. You might be forgiven for thinking that fires in California is new because maybe it's just been on the news. But it always happens. Always. Um, but obviously the severity uh, can be something else. And it, it's been like that uh, the last couple of years, really. And basically it's all the smoke. Uh, getting in the air and polluting the air ultimately and creating like the, the change in the sky so yeah it was really weird it was like that all day as you'll be seeing now or maybe already have um, the, the pictures that I'm putting up uh, the, it was just very odd it was really weird to be walking around where you know at like 10 11 12 o'clock and it was like that all day all day pretty much three four five o'clock in the afternoon and the skies are just completely orange cars are going by with their headlights on and yeah, it was just absolutely peculiar. It really, really was. The following day, it started to go away and it was sort of back to normal. But that day in particular was just a very, very surreal experience. It really was. So anyway, at 9.59, so this all happened like in a minute, I locked outside and the rest of it. 9.59, I called the hairdresser and uh, just as I was calling her, she was opening her door because I could hear her like with the keys and stuff. And I didn't tell her I'd slept in or anything mental like that. Um, I just said, oh, I said, would you mind if I uh, kind of came in like half an hour or something? And she's like, oh, yeah, it's fine, no problem. And she was talking about the skies, like, this is weird, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, it's bizarre. Anyway, so that was good. So went in the shower, nice little image for you. Oh. Um, and then got dressed and went down to the hairdressers. So which moves me on to the hairdresser story. So, yeah, you'll know the hairdresser, like I said, very eccentric. She gives hugs. Uh, her brother was shot and killed. Crikey. Uh, apparently. Uh, by the North Korean police uh, many years ago and uh, yeah, it's just it's very strange it really is but she's nice but just a, a little bit odd um, so anyway so I went down there about half past ten something like that half an hour later than expected and it was just uh, yeah the skies were completely orange uh, as, I, as I've explained it was really really weird experience went in there and um, you know, she was there. Well, she eventually came out. I was standing there for two minutes. 
uh, just thinking this is weird. Now, when I went in there, there was no lights on. Well, apart from one, there was one light on, like a little sort of table lamp. And there's, there's nothing wrong with the electricity. There wasn't a power outage or anything. She just didn't have the lights on, apart from one table lamp. So it looked really weird, and but it was quite nice and relaxing, really, quite therapeutic, because the orange kind of rays were coming in. It was like something out of Bloody Blade Runner. It was really strange. So eventually she comes out after I've been standing there for a couple of minutes, thinking, "Come on, like, what's going on?" And we had the you know the small chat about, "Isn't this strange? This is really weird." And you know, so anyway, she went, "Do you want to come through?" So I went through and uh, sat down at the, like the usual chair, and um, basically had my hair cut in almost pitch black because there was one light on in the corner. And she was like, uh, do, do you mind having the lights off? I was like, oh, it's fine. She went, it's relaxing, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually, it's pretty good. She, I said, she'd always do this. And she was like, yeah, I might actually. <laughs> so she probably is. She's probably took my advice, uh, which wasn't really advice, I was just joking, but she probably took it literally. And now she's uh, cutting everyone's hair in, in the dark. So, but yeah, it was really weird to be, to be sitting there talking to her and, um, and she's, it's not that she's bad at English, but it's not amazing. Even though she's lived here for forty something years, it's it's not great English, but it's it's enough to get by. But you've kind of got to watch what you say. If you overcomplicate it, you're gonna lose her. But if you you know simple English, then it, it's totally fine. And um, but yeah, it was a, it was a unique experience sitting there in almost pitch black, apart from a little light in the corner of the room of the whole hairdresser's salon. And a couple of windows where like the rays are shining. I should have took a picture. I really should have because it was quite artistic. It really was. So anyway, had my hair cut. Thirty dollars. It's about sort of twenty-five quid. Unbelievable Just for that. Unbelievable, really. Um, and then you've got to do a tip. Five dollars. So it's funny because when I look back in the UK, I hardly ever gave tips to anybody because it's not really in the culture. Or at least it wasn't. I don't know if it's changed. Maybe you can let me know if it has or not uh, in the last sort of 10, 12, 15 years that I've been over here. But in America, it's, it's honestly, it's tip capital. Everywhere you go, you should tip. Now, if you don't tip, you're not going to get arrested, but it's kind of frowned upon. It's, it's a little bit weird if you don't do it. So 10%, 15% maybe of whatever the bill is, that's kind of what you're looking to tip. So if we get like a, a pizza delivered, for example, I'll probably tip like between five and sort of, seven dollars or something like that or if we've gone out for a meal i might round it off to 10. i don't want to i'm typically tight-fisted and british in that way i think that's a scottish side of me it's like i don't want to give anyone anything <laughs> charity begins at home but over here you um you've kind of got to do it it's uh, just etiquette it's the way it is so that's that um yeah it was a very a very strange experience uh, the whole skies being orange and but now it's back to normal. The fires are still kind of going on. Um, the past, well, not the past couple of days, they've been fine, but maybe a few days ago, there was a really bad kind of smoky smell. I mean, really bad, which can't be great for people's lungs. Um, yeah, and that's obviously the, the, the fires. Now, they're not anywhere particularly close, so don't worry, in case you were. In case you were. Um, but you know what the wind's like, it kind of travels, obviously, and then spreads the fumes and things from um, a fair bit away. So it, it's within the vicinity, but not to the point where it's dangerous. We're, we're well away from that, well away from that. Um, but yeah, obviously there've been big issues with uh, with fires and, and that's part of, um, it's just, just the way it is really in California. A lot of woods and forests and trees and that's just the way it is. It's sad, it's terrible. Um, and hopefully, obviously, the, the least amount of people that are affected, the better. So with that said, let's move on to, do you know what? I wonder if this is ready yet. About to scold my mouth. Actually, that's all right. Pleased. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, what should we talk about? Yeah, how about what I've been playing? Let's start with that one. Now, behind me, I'm not going to dwell on this, but you, you'll be able to see. It's a Need for Speed 3 on the PS1. This will be on at Pickups Vid in the near future. Maybe next week. I do keep threatening, as ever, to make a music vid. I'd, I'd really, honestly, I'd love to do one, at least one a month. Uh, so may and the earlier in the month, the better. So maybe next week we'll do one of those. I know I always say it. Uh, if you're into music, please watch it. If you're not, please don't. It's really, it's one of those things. Uh, if you're not interested, I'm sure I'll do something eventually which you are interested in. It's, it's really not a big deal. Um, it's just, as ever, for people who like music. That's all. 
Um, but yeah, so whether I do that next week or not will remain to be seen. A pickups vid will definitely happen either next week or the week after, and this will be one of them. So yeah, I've been really enjoying it, but uh, more of that then. The two games I'm going to talk about. Um, now let's leave that one to, to last. The first one is on the PC. So yeah, been really into the PC recently. Oh, it's so good. I don't want to give it the whole kind of, you know, hashtag PC Master Race, but oh, bloody hell. It's, it's, once you start playing on PC stuff, it's, it's hard to pick up a controller again. Um, but I'm trying to balance. It's a juggling act. There's a time and a place for both. But anyway, the game that I've been playing on the PC is called Cloudpunk. And it's brilliant. I really like it. It's a bit of a mixed reception that it's got, but I love it. So that's, I guess, the most important thing. So I had my eye on this game uh, probably last year, I think it was announced, and I thought it looked really cool. I mentioned Blade Runner before about like the orange skies and the rays, and it's kind of got a very Blade Runner or a fifth element kind of feel to it. You know, uh, neon drenched skies and uh, the rain coming down and like the cyberpunk uh, kind of um, style to it. And essentially what Cloudpunk is, it's a, um, it's what kind of game is it? Is it, what, what you are is you control a girl called um, Rania and you work for a company called Cloudpunk, hence the title of the game, and you've basically got to deliver packages around the city. Uh, the city's called Navalis and it's run by uh, Corpsec. It's kind of a big sort of greedy corporation. And um, Cloudpunk are kind of, if I've got it right, um, as, this is my interpretation when I was playing it, they're kind of sort of like a renegade company. They're not strictly legal. In fact, they're probably very illegal, uh, maybe. Um, but they're doing all these shady businesses of uh, not necessarily bad stuff, but just uh, it goes against what at least the monopoly, what, um, you know, uh, the um, the clouds, uh, not Cloudpunk, what do you call them? Um, Corpsec. I had a mental freeze for a minute there. I had to edit the video because I was thinking for like 10 seconds. Like, what the hell? Corpsex. Yeah, so what Corpsex kind of stand for, uh, you know, he's kind of, I, I think it's sort of like sort of a big, big corporation and uh, yeah, maybe it's sort of like, almost like a Rupert, uh, Rupert Murdoch kind of thing. So not many people are sort of liking that. Anyway, so Cloudpunk, this organisation, delivering packages from, from A to B. Uh, some things are a little bit shady, some things are not. Uh, but it's all about, you know, making money on the side and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, basically it's all set in like 24 hours, apparently, the storyline. There isn't a clock that goes by or anything. Uh, it's just you know, all at night, it's all dark, it's raining. For the most part, there's a couple of sections where it isn't. And, um, yes, yeah, so you get into your, your hover, as it's called, like your vehicle. And you're uh, just driving around taking these pack packages. There's a couple of... Um, timed ones where there's a, uh, a timer going in the corner. I think there's two or three of those. What I like about that, and some may not like this, is if you get there in time, then great. Uh, you've kind of passed the mission and you might get a couple of collectibles or something. And if you don't do it, oh well, too bad. You don't get a second chance. That's it. It's gone. It's part of the storyline. And I personally, I really like that. It, it's, it helps with the immersion. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good game. It's a, here's the thing. It's an indie game. It's $20 retail. I think this month, actually, it's coming to the PS4, the Xbox One, and the Switch. But it's been out on the PC, I think, since March time, there or thereabouts. And it was first announced, you know, about, like I said, at least a good year ago. So, yeah, I think graphically, it, it looks really good. It's just an indie game, so don't expect anything crazy and AAA. It's not like that, but it looks nice. And one of the great things, here he goes, bloody PC Master Race. One of the great things about the PC is you can cater it to how you want to play it. So do you want the faster frame rate, although it's not really that appropriate for this game? Or do you want the graphics ultra? You know, do you want to have them quite low and it for, to run faster? Or depending on your PC, maybe you can do it all anyway. Uh, mine's a, a good one, so I can have it at all the best settings, really. But the PC is fascinating because in-game you can change... I, I, there are some console games you can do this for, admittedly. It's becoming a more um, prominent and prevalent in, a, in the PS4 and maybe PS5 era. But uh, definitely with PCs, you can move all the sliders around. And I'm just finding it fascinating, just putting a game on and putting the settings really low, like the graphics to low settings, and looking at it and playing it and seeing how it runs. And then immediately like, pausing the game, going into the settings and putting up a notch to like medium and high and ultra and just seeing what the differences are. And it's just really fascinating. I mean, it's just blowing my mind. Like seeing all the extra detail and then what, you know, if you put it down to low, what's missing? And it could be like ray tracing could be taken off and all that kind of stuff. 
it's just really fascinating in a very geeky way. And um, so I'm liking that. Anyway, so, Cloudpunk. So, it's quite a short game. I'm going to estimate that maybe the actual game from start to finish, because I have finished it, is about maybe 10 hours. So it's not that long. Uh, I mean, you can fly around and do stuff, and the, you can um, stop off at like parking places and get out on foot, and you can collect uh, collectibles. So there's loads of little side quests, which is quite nice. But the main campaign, if you want to call it that, is about 10 hours. It's pretty simple. Um, but yeah, one of the things I love is getting out on foot and walking around uh, in a, like a first-person mode. Now, I think the first-person mode was added relatively recently. Again, one of the cool things about PCs, and I know consoles do this as well, uh, you know, with patches, they can add things to the game. Because before that, I think it was like kind of a, a third person kind of view, and it just, and like a very kind of panned out view as well, and I, I didn't really like the look of that. But the third person is just brilliant, I absolutely love it. So with the keyboard, with the WASD controls for left, right, up, down, and then the shift button, which is, can be a crouch or a run or you know, slow walk, uh, I inventory, M for map, all these things. I'm really getting used to the keyboard now. It's really cool. I still love consoles, don't worry. But the PCs, it's yeah, it's it's really good. Really liking it. I'm not going to lie. So yeah, just walking around the the neon drenched um, city of Nivalis, interacting with people. They've got the voice acting for loads of characters. Now I found it quite. It was disappointing in a way because I remember going up to one guy. One of the first people that I went up to was like kind of a, a food stall. And he, he was a brummy, and he went something along the lines of, brace yourself, All right, how can I help you today? That's pretty good, that, wasn't it? And I thought it was funny. I was like, oh, bloody hell, I've got a brummy. A brummy in the game. How amazing is this? It just seemed, I, I guess, unusual. So I thought, that's quite nice. So, and then there's all these other people, like Americans and posher Brits and all that kind of stuff, and from uh, elsewhere in the world as well. And then I went up to another guy uh, a little bit later. I think he was like kind of a street vigilante or something, and pressed E to talk to him. And uh, and he started to talk in a, a Cockney accent. Like, all oh, right, what are you staring at, sunshine? It's pretty good as well, isn't it? And I thought, oh, God, God, they've got a Cockney in here as well. But what I soon discovered is that the guy who was doing the Cockney accent sort of morphed into like uh, a Brummie, essentially. So he went something along the lines of, I'm going to butcher this, what are you staring at, mate? Do you want a cup of tea? And it was just like, hang on a minute, he's gone brummy there. That's not normal. See, it was like a brummy trying to do a Cockney accent. He should have just hired me. I mean, seriously, I'd have nailed it. So, and that slightly broke the immersion because it made me think, why couldn't they have just hired someone who is a Cockney to do that accent? You know, why can't they have just done that? Instead, that it sounded like they had the same person doing multiple voices, and it was a little bit disappointing. So I presumed that maybe the crew of the game, because it's an indie game, remember? I thought maybe there's not that many people made the game. But when the game finished and the credits like kind of came up on like, it's, and it was nice how they did that on like billboards around like the um, the city of uh, the skyscape of, of Navalis, it said like voice actors, and there was like seemingly hundreds of them, and that made me think, well, why, what? Why did they bugger that up then? Why couldn't they have just got someone else to have done that? Well, anyway. So that was that. So other than that, the voice act, it's very cheesy. It's, you know, it's, again, it's an indie game. So this is not AAA. Um, there's a few flaws and all the rest of it. But for the most part, I thought it was quite good. Voice acting, um, even though it definitely is cheesy and a bit rough around the edges. Graphically, it looks really, really nice. It's a cross between, well, it looks a bit like Minecraft, really, with those blocky kind of um, looks to it. But it looks really, really good uh, with the neon lights and um, the gameplay is quite limited for what it is because it's essentially just a, you know go from point A to point B, deliver the package and then like, there's a storyline unfolding, you get to learn a little bit about a few characters and all the rest of it. There's some DLC coming out as well very soon uh, before the end of the year which is I think going to add some more missions to it and um, an aspect of a multiplayer to it which I won't be interested in. Uh, with like hover racing, I might try it, but it's I'm not really that bothered. But it might be quite cool to like uh, go in your hover and race around the city against like other cars and stuff. Uh, ideally, computer controlled people. I don't think I'll be interested in doing it against like real people. Too competitive these days, and I can't be bothered. So uh, the city itself is actually quite big. As soon as you go out of one district, you can go into this like kind of um, morph zone where it takes you into another one. So there's several of those. You get your home as well, your apartment, and you can furnish it, which is cool. Unfortunately, you can't 
put the objects like the, the bed and the fridge and the TV, all that kind of stuff, you can't put them where you want. When you buy them, the game just puts them in a designated place. So for immersion and geekiness, uh, I'd have liked it if they could have, or maybe could do in the future, change that so you can put them where you want and you can furnish it to your own personal requirements and your tastes. So that would be a good idea, I think. And maybe add even more things, because there's probably only about 10 things maybe that you can add. There's upgrades that you can add to your car, it can go faster and um, descend and ascend quicker. Uh, that's good as well, but again, it's quite limited in that sense. Uh, there's no energy, You don't. there's no fighting in the game, there's no shooting, not, none of that nonsense. It's just walking around or flying around, going from point A to point B. Um, but you can buy food, as I touched upon before with the, uh, with the Brummie, uh, and other people as well, other accents uh, of people who have food stalls. You can buy different kinds of foods and drinks and you can consume them, but it's pointless because you don't, you're not regaining like any stamina. There's no stamina levels, so you're just doing it for the sake of it. So that was a bit odd. Um, you're just doing it, I guess, maybe if you want to sort of immerse into the environment and just pretend that your character wants something to eat. So that, that's a little bit strange how they didn't do that. So maybe they could add like a stamina thing in there, maybe not. Um, it's probably good how they've got it, to be honest. It's just a bit weird, like I say, how you can buy food and buy drinks, uh, but there's no point of eating them. Uh, loads of collectibles that you can buy and ultimately sell to get more money. There's a few things you can buy, like um, aesthetics, like you can put on different jackets. And if you pan out with the X button, if you don't want to have the third, uh, uh, the th uh, first person view, then you can see your character dressed in what you've um, put them in, the attire. Uh, Rania, the character. Different coloured shades and all the rest of it. Uh, it's, again, it's quite limited. Uh, it'd be nice if they add more things, but it, it's alright for what it is. So, yeah, what else do I want to say about the game? I just, I like it, it's good, I've been looking forward to it for ages, it's very short, but the setting is really, really good, so if you've got a console, a modern console, then you may want to check it out, I think they've got physical versions as well, it might be through that limited run thing, um, so if not, I guess you'll have to be downloading it, unless you're not, you know, wanting to, uh, to do that, maybe you want the physical thing, which of course is understandable, for the PC, uh, obviously, I, I downloaded it on Steam. Twenty dollars retail. I bought it for fourteen. It was on a sale, so I thought fourteen dollars, which is about twelve quid. I thought that's a good price. So maybe more in the future of, of Cloudpunk. Maybe um, you know when they do the DLC, I'll talk about it a little bit more. But I really like it. I've got to be honest. It's it's a good game. Now, last up for this particular vid, I've been playing a game. I've not yet finished it because bloody hell, it is so frustrating. And that's not a good thing, is it? When you're playing a game which is frustrating, that's not a good sign because we play games for fun. We want to be, you know, we want, and we want them to be enjoyable and to be relaxing and entertaining. And it, it, it is to a degree, but ultimately it's stressful. And it's a game that I had in my, I think, was it my last pickups vid? It must have been. And it's on the 360 and it's Afro Samurai in this uh, really nice slipcase, as I think I touched upon last time. A double slipcase, really, in the sense that the game slips out but also there's a little kind of clip here and it opens up on there, pretty nice. And at the time, I think when I made that pickups vid, I thought it'd be quite unusual, oh, is it a rare game? Um, and it was only $10, I think, there or thereabouts. So I thought, well, yeah, let's snap it up. Uh, it turns out it's not really that rare at all um, and it's pretty common-ish. Um, so yeah, anyway, so it's basically a sort of a free roaming action adventure uh, based, uh, as you can imagine, sort of like a samurai environment. The voiceover, start with some positives, uh, the narration by Samuel L. Jackson is really good. It's really good. Uh, there's a few uh, silly lines in there, but there's also some genuinely funny lines. And I'm not really someone who tends to laugh too much at video games. Everything else, it probably will, but games, I, I don't really find them too funny. I don't know why, but this one has had me laughing a few times with some of the, live, uh, some of the lines uh, by Samuel L. Jackson, the way he delivers them. It's just funny. Uh, I will give him that, for the most part, and uh, and not particularly repetitive. A few things, of course, but there's a lot of new stuff in there, and I quite like that. So that's a good thing. Graphically, I think it looks outstanding. With the kind of cell-shaded look, it still looks fresh. I mean, when you go up to certain objects, like the textures are very kind of 360 PS3 era. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, it just looks really, really nice. I need another bloody drink. That's what happens when you talk for too long. So, um, 
yeah, no problems with the visuals. Uh, the score, the sound, the music is pretty good. Uh, the Wu Tang Clan, uh, that, yeah, not Clan, the Wu Tang Clan, that's the ones. They're in this. It's not my kind of music, if I'm honest. But that said, I don't mind the odd thing here and there. And there's definitely a couple which are really good. Uh, it's not really the stuff I buy, but in terms of listening to it and going, yeah, actually, that's all right. Um, yeah, one or two in particular, and they work so well with the environment as well. So if you're definitely into that kind of music and that band, that group, then you're probably going to really like this. Some really good mixes. Like I say, it wouldn't really be something I'd buy, uh, but that's not to say I can't appreciate it and can't listen to it, uh, maybe on a Spotify or something like that. So that's pretty good. But here's the problem, and it's a big one. There's a couple of problems, really. Uh, crucial, borderline, game-breaking issues. Not quite, but borderline. And one of them is the camera angle. Now, you've got to remember, this game, obviously, it's a 360. It's a relatively early one. 2009 it came out, so obviously it had been in development for probably at least a couple of years, if not more. So, an early game in that sense. And the camera angle at times, often, is a hindrance. It will be responsible for you um, absolutely losing many lives in this game, to the point where you just didn't do what it said you did. You know, it'll, it'll put you, like, you'll jump, and it'll put you, like, it'll make you jump on, like, a bridge, on, like, a rope. And you think, bloody hell, if I just move here, I'm going to fall off. And then sure enough, you fall off. Or there'll be like a, a, a wall, uh, like on the side. So you've got to do some like side running, side wall running. So you do that, I think, by um, running, um, pushing the, 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 the analog stick. And then just as you run and just as you make contact with the wall, hold down A or press A and then you'll run until you let go. But if you don't time it right, you're going to fall down and you'll have to restart. And it's like, I did not do that. It's the controller, you know. I know a good work, uh, worksman never blames his tools. But honestly, if you've played the game, you know what I mean. And if you haven't played the game and you do play the game, you'll see what I mean very quickly. So that's frustrating. Um, what else did I find annoying? There's a few what are kind of like quick time events of sorts where you hold down, I think it's the LT, let me see, I've got control here. Yeah, it's the LT trigger, I think. And at the same time, pressing the, the Y button, the yellow button. And that essentially makes the, the screen kind of slow down a little bit. And it's like a really powerful swipe of your sword. So, for example, you may need to do it if you want to cut some rope. And there'll be like, the rope will be shining. So it's telling you what you need to do, like a bit of a clue. But if you're not lined up perfectly to where the game wants you to be, you're not going to strike and snap and break that rope or that box or whatever it is that you need to do. And you can be standing there and you've got it lined up. You've got the controller and you're like, well, I can clearly see I'm in line. But if you're not in the position that the game wants you to be in, then it's not going to work. So you might have to like move an inch, literally an inch, and then it still might not work. But then, and it's, oh, it's so frustrating. And then eventually eventually it could take you a dozen attempts or more you have finally got in position where the game wants you to be in hold down lt press the the y button and then uh, then i guess it's the r button is it or maybe it's lt again to actually do the swipe action and uh, and then it'll do the cut sequence will come in like a bit of rope will snap and then a bridge will open or some things will fall down and you can go through or whatever it is it's like, come on, that's really annoying. That happens a fair bit in the game. That leads me to another part of the game which is pretty frustrating, and it's boss fights, or mini-boss fights, sub-bosses if you like. And there'll be several segments where you'll be approaching one of these uh, bosses, but before you get to them, there'll be maybe several different enemies will come out at once. So you'll get like a batch of four or five or six, sometimes more, whatever it is, and then you'll defeat those, and then another half a dozen or more or less, or whatever it is again, they'll come on. And then eventually, you'll get to the point where it's the main boss. Now, if you, let's say, get to the main boss, and you kind of, you, you die, and you restart. It doesn't restart you at the boss, it restarts you back to those like two or three waves of enemies before you get to them. And some of those enemies are tough. Like I'm three quarters of the way through the game, and I guess, I don't know for certain, but I think uh, probably at least 75% of the way through. And so the enemy's getting a little bit progressively trickier, a little bit harder. And I'm at a point where I'm on a bridge. Um, so I mentioned before about falling off bridges, it's done this to me a couple of times as well, where I just didn't do that. But it threw me off the bridge. Okay, fair enough, whatever. And then you've got to start again. So these five samurais is where I'm at right now in the game. They come out 
can't remember what they call themselves, some nickname or you know that they've got, and um, like the groups called like the, the five um, horsemen. Or they're, they're not on horses; they can't be that. But whatever it is, and they come out and they're pretty tough. And uh, but once you beat them, and they can drain your energy, and your energy as well replenishing uh, is either slow or it just doesn't happen. Uh, I've not really worked it out until it gets to a checkpoint. I think it just because um, you can't. I don't think you can pick up potions. Maybe I've kind of forgotten that bit already. But your energy, basically, once you take some hits, you're in danger of having to restart from a checkpoint. So, because they're so good, these enemies, they do knock quite a bit of energy off you. So when you finally beat them and you get the next batch of people on this bridge, which is like half a dozen ninjas, and then, it's really cool actually, to be fair, you're fighting these ninjas, and as you're doing it, you can see running up the bridge, like these, and to be fair, they're weaker enemies, but there's like about ten of them. And before you know it, your energy is very, very low. It's not replenishing because... The tough guys, the samurai, have sort of taken a lot of energy off you. And even though the, the guys that you're fighting are not that strong, there's a lot of them and they're surrounding you. So one hit and you're really in trouble. And especially if you start taking several hits, it's like a case of like, well, you'll restart. And then you'll restart at the back again or the start again, where you've got to start with the bloody samurais. It's so frustrating. But what makes it even more frustrating is earlier on in the game, and maybe even after this point, it's not always like that. It could be a situation where you get through two or three different waves of enemies, get to the boss fight, and then during the boss fight you lose a life, but it restarts you at the boss. So you don't have to go through all that stuff. So sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, and that is really annoying. Really annoying. So, um, yeah, and it, and it will make you stress. It will uh, make you swear. I mean, the amount of times I've, honestly, I've wanted to grab that controller and I've wanted to, to just bloody catapult it through the window. <laughs> I haven't done it, obviously. Uh, but yeah, it's really, really frustrating. So what, that's how I'll sum the game up. It's really frustrating. It's cheap. It, graphically, it looks really good. Thankfully, it's cheap. Imagine paying like $50 or more. Although, ironically, I guess that was the retail, wasn't it? But now, imagine paying $50 if it was rare or desirable or something. Uh, you'd feel pretty ripped off, I think. So what I recommend is buying the game, because here's the thing, it is a good game, it, really, frustrations aside, it's good in terms of like the environment, the graphics are really nice, the uh, narration is really good, so it's worth playing, but what may make it a good experience is when you start the game, lower the difficulty. That's not going to help with the camera angles, they're still going to be a nuisance, the quick time of sorts events are still frustrating, but it may help with the, the difficulty curve, especially at least when it comes to these like mini bosses and the waves of enemies, which uh, yeah, are frustrating. So if you put it on an easier difficulty setting, you may get something out of it. So yeah, I, I'm gonna have to really, even though I said it's a good game, it's a frustrating game. I think I can't, I can't really give it a seven. I'm gonna have to give it a six, which sounds bad. It's not bad. It's, I've just given the reasons why. Um, it's just frustrating, unfortunately, but give it a try and let me know what you think. I am curious, or if you've played it before, I'm curious to know whether you agree about the camera angles and the, the music and the sound and the graphics and the checkpoints and all that kind of stuff. So, oh, yeah. Bit of a frustrating experience. Let's quickly talk about what I've been watching. I'm really, really going to quickly sum up the first thing because I think there's half a dozen episodes, maybe more, and I've just watched one. I can't even remember what you call it, but I'll be putting a picture of it on the screen. And it's a football documentary, so not for everyone. So again, another reason to maybe talk about it quite quickly. And it's the Fly on the Wall Tottenham Hotspur documentary. So is it called something like to do is to dare or to dare is nothing or something like that, isn't it? Or all or nothing? No, not all or nothing. Was that the city one? I can't remember. Um, but there's been a lot of these football documentaries, uh, and this one's on Amazon Prime. There's been, obviously, the City one. I think the first one uh, in recent times, wasn't it the Liverpool one? Being Liverpool, it was called. And there's Sunderland have done one. Leeds United have done one. Uh, there's probably many, many others. So, yeah, Tottenham are the latest to do it. And it is kind of interesting if you're a football fan because it's a nice insight into, like, the players and the managers and uh, how, we, how a football club is run, I guess, on a daily basis. You get to see transfers taking place. You get to see things like the medicals. You get to hear the discussions between agents and scouts and chairmen and owners and managers and players. You know, and you don't, you, we don't really have access to that kind of stuff. So from a, a fly on the wall perspective, it's entertaining. I'm only one episode in, like I say. So I do like it, but you do wonder like, how much of it are they playing up to the cameras? Because they know the cameras are on. 
Um, but maybe there's an element of that, maybe there isn't, I don't know. But So yeah, um, only one episode in, Maurizio, uh, or Maurizio Pochettino had just been sacked and uh, they didn't really show too much, maybe for sensitivity purposes. Because I was like, I was wondering, are they going to show him actually getting sacked? Because there was a lot of rumours about that a few months ago, because obviously everyone knew this was being recorded for TV, uh, for, a, for a TV programme. So a lot of people were like, are they going to show this? Are they going to show him getting sacked? How insensitive. And that's true, it would have been insensitive, but it would have been interesting to watch. Imagine that, a cringeworthy stuff, if they'd have had him on camera and then being told he's losing his job. So they didn't actually show that. Whether they've got the footage or not, who knows, but they didn't show that. They instead just kind of, you know, gloss over it a little bit. And the main focus is on Jose Marino getting the job and taking over and all the rest of it. And uh, So yeah, it's interesting so far. Um, but yeah, I've only watched one episode and I think I'll, I'll sit down and watch the rest. Uh, well, in the future. Maybe I'll start with the second episode tonight. So, if you're into your football, you might want to give it a try. The second thing I've watched, and it's going to be the last thing I talk about uh, when it comes to what I've been watching on this vid, and it's called Dez, uh, and it was on ITV. Now, obviously, we don't get ITV in America, but I noticed, uh, I think someone had mentioned it maybe on Twitter, and um, I thought, that sounds really good, David Tennant. And I really like David Tennant. Everything he's been in that I've watched, I've really liked. So I said to my wife, well, let's watch this. It's going to be really good. And she was like, yeah, all right, let's give it a try. So I went on to a Pirate Bay, obviously, downloaded it. And listen, it's not illegal because we don't get ITV here. So how, was, how am I meant to watch it? Come on, think about this. So, uh, yeah, I downloaded it and um, all in HD and all the rest of it. And we watched all three episodes. Watched two one day and watched, I think, the final episode like the following day. So basically, if you're not aware, it's a, it's a real story. Sadly, really, obviously, of course, because it, Dez is a serial killer. So uh, that's who uh, David Tennant plays. And um, But the way it's done is very interesting because I thought, oh, God, is this going to be quite gory? How are they going to approach this? What angle are they going to come from? But it's not a spoiler because it starts right at the start. But if you think this is going to be a spoiler, uh, even though it's a true story, so, you know, um, then feel free to skip this bit. But um, it basically starts, the TV show, as he's been arrested. Uh, ultimately, he's been found out and um, the cops are turning up and uh, he's very nonchalant. It's like he just doesn't care. It's like he wanted to be caught. Uh, in fact, he kind of says that, in whether that's what he really said in actuality, but it's what he says in, in the TV show. And then the rest of the, the show, it doesn't go back in time, because I said to my wife, I was like, oh, how are they going to do this? Because it literally starts, as I say, him being arrested. And we were like, well, I was like at least, are they going to go back in time and like show everything as it happened? But that's not what happens at all. I don't think, uh, there might be one or two, but I don't actually think there are any flashbacks. It's just all kind of deals in the here and now or back in, because this happened from 78 and finally it happened in 83, he committed his last crime in 83 and he was arrested in 1983. Uh, so the, the, the program is basically set in 1983 and it follows him, you know, being arrested, um, you know, going to court, um, the journalists talking to him, the police talking to him, trying to get more information from him, why did he do what he did and all that kind of stuff. And you'd think, wouldn't you, like three episodes, can they really do that for three episodes? Would it get boring? Didn't get boring. I thought it was really, really good. I did think, and I could be wrong, it was just a gut feeling, that David Tennant used a lot of ad lib when he was talking. It didn't seem as if he was sort of, as if there were lines from a script, loosely based, um, especially when he's being sort of um, interviewed, you know, in like the police station in custody and all that kind of stuff. Some of it seemed as if he was just making it up uh, on the go. But obviously he's a talented actor, so it worked. But because it seemed to me at least that it was very much ad lib it was that fine line where it wasn't quite acting but it wasn't quite as if he was standing in a room with you it was somewhere sort of in the middle it was it wasn't quite professional but that was kind of good if you know what i mean it, it made it seem a little bit more real uh, in a way so I, I liked how that happened whether it was intentional or not i don't know but the rest of the program i thought was really really good uh, fascinating story really just just absolutely bizarre horrific of course, what he did uh, killed as many as 15 people just because why not? Um, the majority of them homeless people. And uh, and yeah, it's just very interesting, fascinating really. Just a glimpse into the mind of how people can do such bizarre and horrible, obviously, things. It's just, but it's fascinating. I think most of us, even though we don't obviously condone it, shouldn't have to say that, it is fascinating, isn't it? It's just weird how it kind of works and how some people are like that. And 
Um, yeah, thankfully, obviously, we all stay clear of, of that kind of caper, but uh, it doesn't mean to say it can't be fascinating to watch and to, to read about and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, Des, ITV, check it out. Three parts, really good. It might sound a bit boring because it's all set in, like, 1983 and you don't really see anything that happens, um, but it's just something more to sort of absorb and to think about and to, and to watch it all unfold. I really liked it. I thought it's good, so um, check it out. Right, sip. And then one more thing to talk about, and it's what I've been listening to. Now, I wasn't going to show this today. I was actually going to show something else. But today, Friday, you'll be watching this at least on a Saturday. Uh, today, Friday, 2nd of October. It, October already? What's going on? Unbelievable. It's the 25th anniversary of this bad boy, Oasis. What's the story? Morning Glory. An absolutely brilliant album. I remember, like it was yesterday, the anticipation of this album coming out, the excitement, the uh, the hype was something else. And um, yeah, it's just uh, just a really, really good record. I've got the CD as well. Back in the day I bought the CD, of course. It's only more re in recent years that I've kind of got into the vinyl stuff. So yeah, what an album. I mean, it starts off with Hello, uh, obviously with Gary Glitters, uh, <laughs> maybe the least said about him the better, uh, with his excerpt from that song. Roll With It, Wonderwall, Don't Look Back In Anger. Uh, Wonderwall for me is a brilliant song. I know it's overplayed, of course it is, to the point where it's maybe sort of oversaturated at like the market and people are a bit fed up of it, but it's a brilliant song. Uh, Don't Look Back in Anger, Hey Now, Bonehead's Bank Holiday is on this as well, which wasn't on the regular album. It's just a good, fun little track, like, kind of like a B-side, an outtake really. Some might say, Cast No Shadow, what a song! She's Electric, Morning, Glo uh, Morning Glory, uh, Champagne Supernova. And then like the two uh, other songs, they're not titled on here. It's got the Swamp Song, isn't it? Or both Swamp Song Part 2 or something. But just a brilliant album. Now for me, as much as I love Definitely Maybe, and I, and I really do love it, uh, and that came out the previous year in 94, this for me is the definitive Oasis album. And that's not the norm. Most people don't say that. They go for Definitely Maybe. And I understand why. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I adore it. It's an amazing album. But this for me is just... It's an incredible record, it's so nostalgic, stands the test of time, you've got to get it, you'll all know it. If you're watching this right now and you've never listened to this, if you're watching this now and you've never heard of Oasis, get out. Get out, listen to them, come back, and then all, all is forgiven. But of course you've heard of them. Um, yeah, just, just a brilliant band and a, an amazing album. And I cannot believe, I just can't believe it's been 25 years, it, it really seems like yesterday when I bought it and the excitement and listening to it and sticking the CD on for the first time. Now, weirdly, I'll put a picture up actually, I can't be bothered, it's just behind me, I can't be bothered to get it. Uh, weirdly, in America, the CD version, the actual literal CD, is just, I think, you'll soon see, is just like a black um, CD with just what's the story, morning glory. But in the UK, it's like, uh, at least the first edition, is of the back of Noel Gallagher's head. <laughs> it's weird how they did that. I don't know why they didn't do that over here. Um, but that's the first thing I noticed when I came to America. Because when I started buying CDs about 10, 12 years ago in America, one of the first that I bought back was Morning Glory. And uh, so when I got the CD and I opened it, I thought, what the hell is this? I was expecting to see Noel's head, but it wasn't. It's weird how, how sometimes they do that. Different artwork for different countries. We see it with games, don't we, all the time? Different artwork in different regions. And it's just like, why did they do that? <coughs> I don't understand. That's that. So I'll have a pickups vid soon, maybe next week, uh, or possibly the week after. That. And of course, I do want to do that music vid. I would like to start making them at least once a month. So, yeah, thanks for watching. Sorry it's been a while in between vids. It's just that thing, isn't it? Are you getting busy? Um, although it's still sort of like a lockdown, a semi lockdown, so busy's a bit lazy. Um, you know what it's like. You know what it's like. But once all is said and done, YouTube, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's a great place when you're in the mood, when you're in the mood to make a vid, when you feel you want to say something, uh, when you feel you want to speak and correspond and interact with like-minded people, such as yourself. Um, it's a good place to, to upload a vid, but never feel under any pressure, just as and when you want to do it. But it's a fine line. You don't want to wait too long, because when you do that, you can't be bothered. Because I think that's where I've been recently. You know, I've wanted to make a vid, but then I've gone to do it and I thought, oh, I can't be bothered. I just don't want to. I'll do it next week. And then next week comes by, oh, no, not in the mood. And then sometimes you've just got to go, right, I'm just going to do it. 
and today I'm in the mood so it's funny how that works isn't it sometimes we just all need a week away or a month away or two months or whatever it is and recharge the batteries anyway I'm just it's wasting your time now aren't I so I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna watch a bit of uh, TV actually I'm probably gonna play this and then I'm gonna have something to eat bet you uh, glad I told you that so until my next vid thank you very much for watching and I'll see you later